this is the first year One City, One Book was international, partly thanks to this talk and a few events taking place in Paris, so full marks to me <laughs> to start. Let's see then how Barry Town speaks Italian. I moved to Ireland in 1979 and by 89 I had three children, I found and left a career in librarianship, was already working in translation but more on the technical side of it and I wanted to break into literary translation. I noticed during my frequent visits to Italy that most of the well-known Irish authors and texts were not available in the bookshops. The world was a bigger place back then, culture didn't travel as fast. So I thought I could go and find something that I wanted to tell them, something that deserved a place in the bookshelves, in the bookshops. And I started scouting the literary reviews, the TLS, other literary reviews like Books Ireland, typing this, sending faxes to contacts, to friends who were involved in literature, till eventually I found this fantastic little book, The Commitments. I picked it up in my local library. I was going through all the Irish names, you know, the Doyle, the Bambils, whatever sounded Irish I picked up. I found the commitments. I read it all in one sitting. I passed it on to my husband, who read it all in one sitting, and we were blown away by it. It was a really fantastic experience. The freshness of the text, the directness of the language, the immediacy of the story, the, the loudness of the tone. I had a couple of contacts in the area, so I thought I'd give it a go. I sent off this proposal and I knew that this could be exactly what I was looking for. I was delighted then when my recommendation was eventually accepted by a publisher, possibly helped by the Booker nomination. I think the Booker nomination for the van might have had something to do with this favour. But here I was, off with my first publishing contract and the team of three little snappers who wanted to help me. They wanted to sit at my map class and type the commitments. So we all went off on this big adventure. What is the challenge of translating? You start with a fine piece of work, a work which is finished, complete, just finished artifact, and you want to end up exactly where you started from. It doesn't sound too easy. It's almost like taking a hammer to a sculpture and then having to put it together again. But fortunately, sculpture, like most other visual art forms and music, can be enjoyed without mediation. And worlds are a lot more flexible than marble. So the trick is to find the right language. Or rather the right voice, the voice of the text that speaks to you and tells you what you should follow. Roddy Doyle himself identifies the function of the voice of the text in describing his achievement as bringing the books down closer and closer to the characters to get myself, the narrator, out of it as much as I can. And one of the ways to do this is to use the language that the characters actually speak, to use the vernacular and not ignoring the grammar, the formality of it, to bend it, to twist it, so you get a sense that you are hearing it, not reading it, that you are listening to the characters. You're getting really close to the characters. And this is a very good way of introducing what a translator does. The translator's task is listen to the voice of the original text and be guided by it in finding the right voice in the target language. So, well, in parallel, we are going, going on far. John Berger, an English art critic, novelist, painter, and poet, gives one of the most inspired and complete definitions of what it is to translate. True translation is not a binary affair between two languages, but a triangular affair. The third point of the triangle being what lay behind the words of the original text before it was written. True translation demands a return to the pre verb One reads and reads the words of the original text in order to penetrate through them, to reach, to touch, the vision or experience that prompted them. One then gathers up what one has found there and takes this quivering, almost wordless thing and places it behind the language it needs to be translated into. And now the principal task is to persuade the host language to take in and welcome the thing that is waiting to be articulated. When I start translating a book, I have three basic commitments. One is to the publisher who commissioned the work, one is to the original author. The most important to me is the commitment to the reader who will read my translation, whose enjoyment of the text should be the same as the reader of the original text. In translation studies, very often there is an analogy between the translator as a servant, servant to the author. I'm a servant of three masters, not just one. And another role that could have to define what 
Und ich weiß nicht, ob das ist der Rolle des Privileges Rieder. Nobody will have penetrated the text as far as it so often, so frequently, to discover a bit like John Berger was saying, what's behind, what brought it about. This was specifically evident for some of Doyle's later works, the Stark of Henry, and his determination to live, the almost raging conviction that he would survive in spite of all the infant death of the time, in spite of all things that went against him. There are pages in Starfield Henry which don't have any full stops. And you couldn't possibly take it and translate it as it is. You almost have to go fill in the bits that you know grammatically, syntactically, logically should should be in that page and probably were at the beginning, without it all out. And then squeeze it back again. So this is the exercise that we do continually with the text. So the translator is the privileged reader, getting so close to the text, behind the text, by setting it in all its components. And if you think of knitting, we almost unravel it, then we learn it how it was done so we can knit it together again. The translator is also a privileged writer, because most of the hard work is done. The, the store is there, you get up in the morning, you're not in the mood, but you sit down, there's something there that you can rely on to move on, to, to go and do it. The story, the characters, the plot, and its intricacies are already set. No case of translator block will ever be as bad as writer's block, as you will always have a firm track to follow. But translator's block does exist. And the closer you are to the text, the more you get stuck. You can't think of the right word. It, there's almost an obstacle that the original language, which you know well, almost stops you thinking beyond. So you remove yourself from it now and again. The right solution comes to you in the middle of the night. It's very, very often that that happens. So when you're doing something completely different. And you always go through a phase of pestering your friends, your acquaintances, your nearest and dearest, and testing things on them. How would you say that? Does it sound right? Suddenly you're doing something and Eureka, you found that world that you've been searching for a day or a week or whatever. When I approached the text, this wasn't the case with the commitments, but I prefer to read the book as I go along because it keeps me going, it keeps the fluency of finding out what's going on. This is not yeah, probably my first complete reading, the first time I read the book from beginning to end. The commitments was different because as I said, I read it all long before. But you will get to know this text so well, you will gradually penetrate through it. But the first impact is important because you want to keep the point of view of the reader, what the reader, the effect that it has on the reader. So you don't want to get stale. You start by reading it there and then as you write. And it's more entertaining to find what's going on as you will it. It's a kind of entertainment. I start to do my first draft, uh, mainly because I want to get the book out of English. As I said, mm, if, the, if you're too close to the original text, you're almost stuck with it, you're not right. But whilst my reading function keeps concentrating on the original, and at each closer reading more nuances come to the surface, in my writing function I want to create this distance and detachment from the original text. To, to remove myself from the influence of the linguistic structures and expressions of the source language, which almost creates a barrier between me and the language I'm searching for. At the same time, I start from the first draft in finding the right voice for the characters, the narrator of the story. And this will be gradually perfected in a second, and the third, and very often a fourth, and more drafts in different phases when I begin to push it all into proper Italian. I also work within the text. This is there are different choices in translation. Some people prefer to read the book, um, start, you know, prepare their ideas, start with the theories. I, as I said, I prefer the direct approach, just blurt it out, get rid of the original gradually and start doing your own work. So it's a matter of choice. Again, I work within the text. My direct relationship is with the text contained within the book covers rather than with the author. And if I have any queries, doubts of interpretation, I can usually sort them out by the context of the book, what, what is within the cover, so the, the language, the sound of the language, expressions that are typical, that are idiomatic, they will tell me why things are written in such a way and what the meanings could be. 
and the culture in which the story is situated. In translating the books of Roddy Doyle, I think I had to consult him through his agent only twice to write them. Once was with the commitments. Um, it was because of Sophia Loring. When the commitment tests get their stage names, I'm Sophia then, said Natalie, Sophia Loring. And the answer is, with a head like that. Does it make sense to you if you think of Sophia Loren? What comes to mind? Is it the head? <laughs> so I, could, I couldn't solve this. I kept asking people acquaintances. That's so why I sent the question and the answer came back. Maybe you can confirm this or maybe not. Apparently in North Dublin, the head is a metaphor for the front. So finally things <laughs> came together and I understood why, why the head. The second time was when I was translating the Giggler's treatment. And gender became an issue. In the whole book, the Giggler's are she, 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 so they are female. But the publisher had a problem with this. They had already prepared uh, the cover, the blurbs, the publicity, and they hadn't caught this. So there was masculine there. So rather than redo what they already done, they distorted the whole thing. And some, I hope some of the, I never checked back, some of the gigglers, I hope they're not all male. But in my conversation with Robbie Lord, I asked, are they like the Red Brigades, a group that could be made indifferently of men and women, but you know, they're plural feminine in Italian, because in Italian everything has a gender, but it's a mixed group. Or are they, by definition, a feminine group, like nuns? The reply was, they are like nuns, but they don't abuse their software. So, <laughs> but unfortunately, due to editorial demands and pressure, they, they didn't keep their femininity. Kidding. Let's come to the trilogy, to the translation of the trilogy. The commitments almost translates itself. The voice and the rhythm of the text are very strong and clear. The language is colloquial, the register is in form. The narrative pace is very fast, and a large part of the text is taken up by the lyrics of the songs. The story is a very specific theme, a very specific cultural setting. So, we kind of hearing the voice of the text is, is easy, it's immediate, it talks to you. The, the same text is very rich in cultural depth. Some are obvious, like when the lyrics of the songs are modified, they are adapted to Dublin, when they start singing the night train with the stations of Kilbarak and, and all the dark stations. When, you know, if, if you are familiar with the book, you know that at the end of each song, the innovation is to add something linked to the reality of Dublin. Other cultural references are woven into the story. Any description, basically, anything we read in the book, hints to the culture, the local habits, the family life, the pub life, the shop streets, names, house, which reinforce and define the setting of the story as essentially Dublin. The Snapper and the Van are also very, very strongly based in Dublin. In the other two volumes we meet the same characters, their story continues to develop and takes on new depth, from the setting up of a voice band we move on to more serious subject, unwanted pregnancy and unemployment. The other members of the family come to the forefront and in turn take on the role of protagonists. We see that Sharon is the main character in the van with her unwanted pregnancy, but all the other members of the family that in the commitment were in the background, barely met going up and down the stairs, they, they, they were not relevant to the plot, now become all rounded. The family is the the main character in the van because if we discover the twins, the delightful twins, we discover the brothers, Doug and the serious guy and the, the way Strait Leslie put in a brief appearance, you almost know that it's going to end up badly. But the, we are immersed in the family life and the family life of the rabbits is the, 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 Dublin, the Dublin place of description of the house even, the front room. You know, when you say the front room you kind of can picture the way that a house in a house estate is, you can picture the neighbours, the garden which is not, mm, not dug up properly, the little cement men which are the little dwarfs that you see in the gardens. And I 
was in touch at some time with a, with a Swedish colleague who was translating, if not one of the books, some, some radio adaptation of the scripts, and she asked me what I did and said, right there. Again, if you live in Dublin, you know, but if you don't, you, you couldn't possibly <laughs> know that those little dwarves are so pure popular and they can be called little, little Samantha. So we've seen that the characters have gained depth, the stories have become more serious, the argument, the topics are more important, but the language and the cultural setting are, have not changed, they remain the same, and we are still in the heart of Baritan. So the linguistic register does not change. The rhythm and the voice of the text remain the same, even when taking on and expressing more complex subjects and feelings. Dublin Soul is a lot of Dublinish, and the whole Baritown trilogy is quintessentially Dublin. Let's see, how do we go about translating the language? The type of language adopted in the translation has to be faithful to the original. You could not tell the stories of the Baritown trilogy using a high linguistic register or academic tones of a standard neutral register. And this is in keeping with what we said about making a commitment to the original author and to the reader of the translation. We want to have a seamless rendition of whatever the author was trying to say in the style he was trying to say, respecting their stylistic choices and ensuring an equal enjoyment of the same story by the reader. So we're getting closer and closer to finding the right voice and the right rhythm local language, slightly substandard linguistic register. In Italian, the use of colloquial substandard language goes hand in hand with the use of local dialect, a rich source of colourful expressions that would be perfect to render the vernacular of the trilogy. But can we do that? Unfortunately not. There is a problem there, because you can't put a dialect, an Italian dialect, in, in the mouth of Dublin characters. That, the, the trilogy has to be set in Dublin. There is no mistaking that you couldn't transfer it to working class anywhere else in the world because it would be forcing what is the original text, it would be telling another story, it would, it would be upsetting everything. So we can't use the dialect that would present a lot of splendid opportunities to render the vernacular with the vernacular. We have to find other ways of steering a very nice course between what the the author wrote and what your language can take, a bit like John Berger was saying, follow, follow the constriction and the restrictions. But there's no way that you can deviate from the fact that the choice of language has to respect the cultural setting. Using dialect is not an option, as it will be totally incompatible with the very precise cultural and geographical setting of the trilogy. It's a bad town, North Dublin. As we've seen, the text is also full of cultural references. And when it comes to the lyric, this is, this is more obvious. The clearest clock puts in an appearance suddenly. Nobody expects it. The band hasn't discussed it. We have Deco singing, I'll search for you down on the docks, I'll wait on the clearest clock. And Jim's reaction is, what was that about? It's just as easy to slip from the English of the lyrics of the songs, which have to stay in English because there were no songs, there, you know, everyone who knows music knows what they are, and introducing the clearest clock in Italian. If left in English, this reference would have been most probably lost on the Italian reader, so it needs to stand out in order to make sense of the dialogue that follows. An Italian reader could easily have thought that that was part of the original song, not being familiar with the song, not noticing the difference. If you want to make sense of what follows um, the debate between Jimmy first, why did you introduce this and the clearest clock? The clearest clock is only for cultures, of the cultures go to clearest. Ah, yes, so how do we get out of that with a topic? It doesn't matter, the clock is outside, so we're not going into clearest, we're just meeting under the clock. If you don't tell them what the clock is and that it's not part of the song, the whole thing doesn't make sense. So you have to constantly pay attention to what the reader perceives. There are a lot of other local cultural references, Mount Joy, the Larry Gogan dog in the snapper, the various geographical locations. You might say geographical locations, do they matter? They do. Because Italian readers probably have not been to Dublin, but they might have, or they might come. And they might find themselves almost at home because they've read about it, they know what it is. So 
If you think of Marco Polo when he went to China and came back and then wrote this fantastic book telling all the things that he'd seen and happened in China, at the time it was extremely unlikely that anybody could have contradicted him and said, no, sorry, I've been to China. <laughs> you can't do that. Now, even different from the 80s or the, the, the early 90s, culture moves very fast. The movies, the, the movies taken from the trilogy already spread the world. As to what the trilogy was, the portrait of Dublin, although with adaptations, a lot of Italian people come to Dublin, they come as tourists, they come as students, they come as workers. So it would be betraying the nature, the reality of the book if you didn't respect all these cultural references. In the case of Mount Joy, the instances I found, nobody, you don't need to tell anyone who's from Dublin what Mount Joy is and what it's there for. You need to tell the Italians. But there's no need to, to lecture, to make it complicated, to use a footnote. You can slip in a word that says, if, if the text had said he was in Mount Joy for two months, you just he was in jail in Mount Joy for a month. Easily, rapidly, no, no problem, no obstacle. Fortunately, the other occurrences already have an explanation. We have, again, in presenting the song of the ch chain gang, where the speaking says that one was dedicated to the lads in jail, Mount Joy and Dash burning for drugs. So it just add, add again, Mount Joy, Mount Joy jail, done, easy. Larry Logan the dog is named after a TV personality, a DJ, I'm not sure if he's still around. But this is explained in the dialogue, so you know exactly what Larry Logan is. There is no sense of strangeness, the, the reader can follow exactly, or almost exactly, as, as in English. But it's not always easy to keep the cultural references as they are and inserting them seamlessly into the text with a minimum of explanation if necessary, without interrupting the narrative. In a fast exchange of banter, when the members of the band are talking about the fact that Joy the Lips, who is the older man of the group, and obviously the girls are all very intrigued by him, they all start courting him, they all try and get off with him. And in conversation, they say, try to get off with Bosco. Now, we know who Bosco is, but to an Italian audience, mysterious. What do you do? You could leave it as is, but it wouldn't work. It would be very, very a strange presence there. You could add something of an explanation, like, it tried to get off with that puppet, Bosco, that's always on TV. But it's a bit clunky and heavy, isn't it? It just doesn't... The rhythm of the conversation, which is a very, very rapid exchange, would be made heavier by it, less natural. It wouldn't sit well with it. You could replace it with an Italian equivalent, but as is the case with the use of dialect, inserting an Italian cultural reference to replace an Irish one is not an option. You know, there are, there are infinite Italian characters which are specifically Italian on TV, but we can't use them. There was a little mouse called Topo Gigio, but he has to stay in it and we can't, we can't place him here. Or we could replace it by a neutral equivalent. Something that would not be out of place in an Irish conversation, easily understood by an Italian public, and maintain the reference to a children's TV program and to the fact that Bosco is not a person, but an imaginary character. And that's how Bosco becomes Tom and Jerry. That's the solution I found at the time. But as I was preparing this talk, and this happened last night in the middle of the night, I realized that if you take away Bosco, it's not so easy to understand. Because the presence of Bosco there tells you that we are dealing with children's programs. If you remove Bosco, as you do in Italian, Tom and Jerry are two names. It could be two people. How does the Italian reader know that we are talking cartoons? So maybe if I had to do it again, Sylvester the cat would have been a better choice. I bear it in mind if I ever have to do a revision, so it becomes clear. Another way of dealing with the elements of the story that cannot easily be understood by a foreign reader or explained likely within the text is the use of footnotes. But this is barely acceptable and only as a last resort in a work of fiction. Best avoid it if possible. Nobody likes footnotes. The readers are constantly interrupted. I remember reading the translation of a Spanish detective story, Vasquez Montalban, you probably know. Every time the guy had something, there was a note saying, 
typical dish from Barcelona. Why? Why do you take me out to say something obvious? What do you expect him to eat? So it, it, I don't know if you share the same feeling. Footnotes are irritating unless they are necessary and essential. Publishers don't like footnotes, they do the best to take them out. So if we can build it into the, into the text, studying light touches, that, that's by far the best solution. Now, then come, let's come to translating the right language. Susanne Gassel was an Austrian PhD student and graduated with a PhD thesis at Dublin City University. And he wrote her thesis on the use of expletives in the grammars. She tells us that there are 15 different swear words used in the text for a total of 420 occurrences, ranging from a maximum of 282 fuck and derivatives to a last matter of slot and piss that only occur once, like a few other words. So, and later, it must have been an interesting word trying to collate all this information. And she has perfectly laid out with graphics, with pie charts. <laughs> A remarkable word. She compared the two existing German translations of the commitments in terms of what words were used to replace what, what are the equivalents, and so on. But the swear words were greatly reduced a mere 209 in one case and 288 in the other. Well, I've never counted mine, and nor, nor I'm planning to, but I would almost have a bet that I would be closer to the Irish words than to the Italian. Than, than, than to the German. Because dealing with expletives presents absolutely no problem in Italy. They are used with exactly the same vigor, the same colloquialism, insults, interjection, exclamations, almost something that you don't notice. It, it, it's in the text, it's ex used in exactly the same way as English, or rather as English as spoken in other. Whereas in German, I'm told, the colloquial use, colloquial use would be restricted to relatively larger euphemisms, like hell, shite, and similar. You couldn't possibly, in the middle of a normal conversation, insert some of the stronger words and then go back to the rhythm of the normal conversation and still be friends with the person you've been telling these terrible things to. So I suppose that contributed a bit to reducing the expletives. So I had absolutely no problem in using the full range. Because in Italian, there is no problem. If you know on the dark during the summer, full of Italian students, if you listen, probably every second word is cazzo, which is the equivalent of prick in terms of translation, but the equivalent of fuck in the colloquial usage. And it's casually inserted into everything. The most innocent and banalis change, partly because of their age, but it's. It, it, it's it's low-level language is full of this type of words. So if you hear them, cazzo fai, cazzo dici, cazzo vuoi, it's just the same as saying, what the fuck are you doing, or saying, oh, what the fuck do you want? And with all the shades, we can turn it down, or turn it up, we can go from flip to fact to fuck, with absolutely the same. The same softness and consideration for what we're saying. We use bodily parts and sexual practices, and we use them liberally, as appropriately or inappropriately as as you might wish. There is a sub subtle but substantial difference though in the use of the C word. In Italian you would never dream of addressing it to a man and calling him names with what is the female genitalia, just would seem to culturally totally unacceptable. <laughs> but what you do is you put into question the, the virtue of the mothers or the sisters, somehow none of the wise, which I suppose are already spoken for, we know they are, you don't need to say, to say that, but insulting the mother of a sister, or a sister for an, for an Italian man, is paramount insulting. So the female genitalia come into play only if, in this